So these are the two base malts we use in probably 90% of our beers. But these are also base malts. And these are also base malts. And those are base malts. And those are base malts. And all of these are base malts. How many more of these things we get? We get like six more. Can you go back upstairs? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, when it comes to base malts, there's a couple of options out there. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Just a few. So we're gonna be going over base malts today. That's our video for you. Uh, what are we gonna be doing though? We're gonna be giving them a full breakdown of uh, the varieties of base malts, right? Yeah, and how you tell basically what style of base malt is by looking at things like color. How it's made. That's really important too. And then all the different ways that you can get flavor off of base malts. Uh, there's a lot to talk about with that too. So, and of course, at the end, it wouldn't be fair if we didn't uh, talk about our favorites and why we use them and what is certain individual base malts do. So let's go ahead and start with the process of base malt and, um, yeah, kind of what makes it a base malt. We touched on the process of making malts in general in our uh, intro to malts video, uh, but base malt specifically, they kind of focus more on two different parts of that, uh, and that's the germination parts. They need to make sure that they are modified to the point that they uh, have basically all the sugars accessible and all the enzymes still intact. And when Peter talks about modification, um, what that refers to is more or less how germinated that malt is and how much of those enzymes are available versus kind of how much flavor is gonna be left in there. Yeah, and if you wanna learn more about that, the end of the malt series, we're gonna be talking to a professional on these things so we don't sound like complete idiots when we're talking about it. So the next step in the malting process is gonna be the killing process. The uh, drying process, like you said. Drying process, yep. like, like I said. Yeah, most malts are almost completely dry when, uh, when they, uh, before they go into the killing process. So there's a couple yeah. of exceptions, but most malts are yeah. complete, almost completely dry. And then in the killing process, obviously with base malts, you don't want to cook off the enzymes or caramelize the sugars at all or burn the sugars. And so the killing process is gonna be at a low temperature for a shorter amount of time when it comes to base malts. Now, this varies, and that how it varies kind of goes into the next part of learning about base malts, which is the color. Speaking of color, <laughs> color is gonna be measured in uh, most commonly Lovabond and SRM. Um, these days, I feel like Lovabond is gonna be the most common one. Yeah, you see Lovabond more often in malts and you see SRM more often in beer, basically. There we go. So speaking of Lova Bond, our lightest malts on the Lova Bond spectrum are going to be our Pilsner malts. These are gonna fall somewhere between um, one and two Lova Bond, so very, very light. Uh, and uh, on the lightest end of the spectrum, we have uh, one of our favorite malts to use, which we'll be talking about at the end of the video. The other thing that goes into making a Pilsner malt, which we won't go into in depth right now, is level of germination. Uh, more often than not, Pilsner malts will have uh, a slightly lower level of modification uh, because you want some of those enzymes and some of the proteins from the Pilsner malts to stay and create character in the final beer as well. Next is going to be our pale malts, also known as generally our base malts for what most people use. Brewer's malt, uh, two row, some people just call it two row. Yep, um, these are gonna be kind of right in the middle. These are gonna overlap Pilsner just a little bit, but generally speaking, you're gonna be looking at two to maybe three Lova Bond um, for these malts, and uh, yeah. And basically, these are just a great thing to use as a, or to consider a blank slate when uh, building recipes. Because uh, when you go a little bit darker, you start to add some sweetness and some other uh, characters to it. Uh, and that's gonna be when you get into the pale ale malt range, the most common pale ale malt being probably Maris Otter pale ale that you see. But there are some, uh, some more neutral and Americanized grains that make pale ale malts as well. Yep, these guys are gonna fall somewhere in that uh, three to maybe even possibly four Lova Bond, depending on how dark of a malt you're going with. Uh, on top of that, some brands will actually create proprietary names for all these. And so when we're talking about uh, nomenclature and how things are named, a good way to kind of map out what style of grain they might be, besides reading the description, is to look at the color of the grain. So like, for example, uh, Thomas Fawcett has Halcyon and Pearl and Golden Promise. All of those are their proprietary names. Breeze does that too. Um, so you mentioned Lovabond, SRM. Uh, there's also EBT. There's a number of color scales. Uh, as a general rule, uh, on the darker end of the, the spectrum, Lovabond and SRM might be a little bit different. SRM is going to be a higher number for the same color. On the lighter end of the spectrum, they're almost interchangeable, especially in this base malt world. So besides color and sugars that base malts offer you, the next thing that they offer is diastatic power. So diastatic power is a very, very important <clears throat> um, factor in choosing a base malt and the type of beer you're brewing. Uh, so what diastatic power really means is it's your ability of the malt 
to change those uh, starches into sugars. And so a couple of things will affect diastatic power. As a general rule of thumb, the darker the grain, the less diastatic power it has. But uh, in addition to that, the degree of modification can affect diastatic power, as well as where you get your grains from. Uh, when it comes to base malts, a good rule of thumb is that all of these malts can uh, fully convert themselves, can create all the sugars you want for, the, for, for themselves, and up to about 30% of other grains that don't necessarily have that diastatic power. With that said, if you have a recipe that has more than 30%, you might want to be looking at a grain that has a really high diastatic power. Um, but also, um, that does come at a somewhat of a cost when it comes to um, the flavor and overall richness of the malt, generally speaking. Um, so that's another thing to consider when recipe design Ing. Yeah, and when we talk about a couple specific malts at the end of this video, uh, we'll make sure to mention which ones we would use for which beers. And if you want to learn more about source grains, uh, we'll talk that to, about those more in depth at the uh, end of this whole series too. We'll do a video specifically on source grains and uh, why each, the heritage of them, how they're grown, what brand of breed and genetics they have, how that all affects things. So by this point we've kind of outlined the differences in color and diastatic power of Pilsner Pale Ale, Pale, uh, all that, but uh, the next thing obviously the malts adds is gonna be flavor. Yeah. So enough with the uh, jargon, let's just get right to the meat of it. Uh, really we use grains and beer because we're trying to get flavor out of them. So, I mean, what's, the, what's gonna be the difference between Pilsner and Pale Malt and Pale Ale Malt in flavor? Well, a lot actually. Well, let's talk about it. Some people think of certain malts, their favorite malts is like the Flay Magnon of malts, uh, you know, where <laughs> whereas others might be the Beef Jerky. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, okay. Uh, uh, but in, in, uh, in reality, basically, when you're choosing malts for certain flavors, you just want to pick the one that works best for your style of beer. Um, when it comes to Pilsner malts, let's start on the light end of the spectrum, you're going to get a light color, obviously, but also a crisp flavor off of that, mm -hmm. generally neutral with just a touch of graininess. Is graininess. What I, call it. I usually think of Pilsner malts also as finishing on the sort of dry side of things as well. Yep. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's, uh, that's gonna be Pilsner for you. So another fairly neutral one that you can use for almost any style is going to be your base two row, just your generic two row. Um, both of these I would consider to be in that, that relatively neutral, can be yeah. good for a light lager. Uh, base two row is obviously op often used for like IPAs, but these are blank slates and yep. your base two row is just, you know, your, your open canvas for throwing whatever uh, specialty malts on it. Yep, you, these are gonna be your most <laughs> neutral profile, like Peter said. Generally, the only thing you might taste them is a very, very mild sweetness. Yeah, that's gonna be the same thing you get from uh, all grains though. Uh, if you want a more intense sweetness and a uh, better uh, richness, a better uh, complexity, you might start into the pale ale range. So things like Maris Otter, things like our uh, local Northwest pale ale and uh, some of our Link pale ales um, are gonna have a much more um, rich flavor profile to them. Um, these guys can, like Peter said, have more sweetness, more richness. Um, I like to describe a lot of these as having almost like a slight bready character or even to the point of like graham crackers or Teddy Grahams, I think is how I describe Maris Otter ones. So these are gonna be malts that using, you know, very little adjuncts in and a somewhat lighter colored beer are gonna give you a, a nice complexity to your flavor profile. Yeah, and then so on top of just the color, the Pilsner pale, pale ale thing, uh, your heritage actually plays a really important role in flavor too. Uh, if you're thinking of which base to use, if you're looking for the more neutral side in the flavor world, you generally wanna go with a bigger maltster, the maltsters that are basically malting for AB InBev and, and companies like that. They're making a ton of production and they have giant farms where they can test everything and make sure that they're getting the exact source grain that they want. Whereas if you wanna play with flavors, um, then the heritage varieties from a smaller maltster are an awesome way to have fun with your brewing process. And it really gives a depth of character. And so try out things like our local malts or Link Malts. We'll link some stuff in <laughs> the description below. Uh, and then also Heritage Grains, like the Baird's 1823 series, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So yeah, obviously tons to go over for flavor. If you've got specific questions on types of malts that we don't cover in the specific malt stuff at the end of this video, please uh, comment below and ask us. So lastly, let's talk about protein content a little bit. Uh, this is something that is overlooked by a lot of people. Don't worry about that. Um, this is actually plays a role in how, how we're gonna match this some degree of clarity and also a lot to do with the body and mouth feel of the final product. Yeah, when we're talking about uh, before with the flavor, the more neutral malts come from bigger maltsters. Generally speaking, that means the uh, less protein also is in those grains because lower protein content is easier to work with, but also means a more neutral overall flavor. And uh, there are specific grains being bred right now um, just to have a super, super low protein content so they can be the most neutral base for people. 
people to make. With that said, back to our heritage varieties, those are generally gonna have a higher protein content. Um, so those are gonna benefit from a few different mashing techniques, things like acid rests, et cetera, et cetera. Protease rests <laughs> or peptidase rests. Yep. If you want to learn more about all those rests, by the way, that's going to be a whole new video. There's a ton we can talk about with different rests, but uh, yeah, let us know. So protein is really the last major component of all these grains. Uh, that covered the general gist of uh, what you can get off of base malts and kind of how to navigate your way through learning about which types to use. But really the only way to know which base malts to use is to use them. Uh, and so we got a couple of grains that we like to use a lot that we should probably go over. Uh, yeah. Uh, for one, what are we sitting on? We got, uh, oh yeah. What's, up, what's underneath us and behind us, the majority of our grains, speaking about uh, pale malts in general, is gonna be Great Western's Pale Two Row. Um, we use these guys um, because for one, they're incredibly consistent, they're a larger maltster. Um, and then two, honestly, because they're somewhat local, just, they're just across the state from us. So um, it's highly recommended. Otherwise, if you got a maltster near you, I'm sure you got something similar. Yep, and uh, uh, cost obviously plays a role in that too. Oh, well, uh, they because can. they're so local and they're not shipping from across the world, uh, they send us a great neutral base malt for a relatively reasonable price. And so that's the one that we choose to go with and we use that probably in over half our beers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say the next most common one that we use or the biggest one that we use is the Heidelberg malt actually. Heidelberg has become one of our favorite malts recently uh, for doing any light um, or even German style um, beer just because it has um, this, this very, very delicate flavor profile to it and has this, um, I don't even know how else to describe it, a very classic German flavor in my opinion. The Heidelberg is a super, super light base malt uh, and we use it not only for uh, the fact that it's light and the fact that it's a really delicate, beautiful uh, malt to use, but also because it has a high enzyme content, which means that we can use it to play around with different mashing techniques, which create super, super shelf stable and consistent, crisp, clear beer. Like the one I'm not drinking yet. Like this. Um, so yeah, between Heidelberg and uh, classic Great Western Two Row, uh, that probably covers 90% of the beers we do. But every once in a while, we're looking for something maybe in that London style world, that classic British beer, uh, and we need a little bit more base character. Yep, which is where Maris Otter is kind of our go-to. Um, but we've actually been playing with the, some of the Maris Otter heritage varieties that even have a little bit more richness than the um, basic Maris Otter Pale Ale. Um, so those have been really fun to play around with as well. And if you want to see a side-by-side -side between Maris Otter and the Heritage variety, uh, watch the video that we've probably already i-carded somewhere in this video. Well, Peter, I think that sums up to the best what we can do of an overview on base malts. I know we missed a few things, I'm sure, but uh, let us know in the comments. We'll try to answer them in later videos. Um, otherwise, hopefully you learned a few things, and uh, we'll see you on our next video, which is going to be... Toasted slash roasted malts. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, let us know if uh, you want to, any specific malts you want us to go over. I'm going to go to bed. Break open. No. Nope. Feel a beer.